All right, so if everyone can start taking their seats. Um, right now, we're going to leave the lights on to begin with. Um, if anyone's having trouble seeing, either A, move up, or B, um, we can turn the lights out. Just let us know, or let someone in the back know. Um, all right, so this is about professional Unity patterns. Um, I've been doing Unity for a while. I, I have a lot of fun doing this stuff, and I have spent years, well, I'm actually, I, I've been a professional developer for like 20 years, and then developing some odd number of years before then. Um, but uh, one of the biggest problems that I run into and that I've seen other developers run into, and this doesn't matter if this is professionally developed projects or projects that you're developing on your own as a beginner, um, you almost inevitably get to a point in your project where you want to throw the whole thing away and start over again. I'm, I, I'm getting some nods here, so pretty much everyone I'm sure is familiar with this at least. And if you haven't run into it yet, um, Give it a few more years of experience and you will. All right. <clears throat> so uh, one thing is there's a little bit of lag between me and my remote display. Ooh, that actually worked. OK. OK, so this is me. I did a bunch of stuff. I'm an MSMVP, blah, blah, blah. And there's my cat, Mario. Um, if you're interested, I am on LinkedIn. You're welcome to connect to me. Um, uh, but the really the only reason that I get Unity jobs these days is because of uh, a Unity tattoo. <laughs> I go into a place, they're interviewing, how do we know you're passionate about this technology? All right. So let's start out. Evolution and programming. First thing is we get introduced to a computer, or if you're old enough, you got introduced to punch cards. Um, but we have a computer and all of a sudden it opens up this world of like, look at all these things I can do with a computer. And then at some point, you learn to program. So you can actually start writing code. And it's like, oh my god, wait a minute. There's all this software that I could be spending my money on, or I could actually go build it. And you start learning all the things and you realize, like, oh wow, I've got all this power. And it eventually leads to very, very overcomplicated programs even tiny little things that you're trying to do, you eventually get to a point where you almost always want to throw it away. And that's one of the big things about like object-oriented programming and modern day standards for code. You want to make code reusable. And one thing I will point out early is, I'm sure almost everyone in here, with this, particularly I'm assuming if you're in here you have some coding experience, um, particularly some interest in Unity at least. Um, but that's, the, since this is focused heavily on Unity and C-sharp, but it does relate to almost any other language. I will make that clear as well. So if you're programming at all, designing projects, and technically, even if you're not programming, but you're doing just any other trade skill, this, a lot of the things from this will start to carry over well. Okay. So you get to the point where your code is complicated, and you just want to throw the whole thing away. You want to get rid of it. And this is definitely out of sync, but it works. OK, so you throw out your code. You come up with a completely new concept. You're, you're, you're not dumb. No one in here is dumb. But you're, and you're, you're facing these new things. It's like, hey, I had these problems. I'm learning from them. I am going to fix this. So the problems I had, I'm going to invent this new way of dealing with that. So you, start, you, you write it out. You start. Maybe even you start, you start going into all sorts of different angles of it and looking at like every part of your project where it messed up. And you write down a path of where you're going to make it work. And then you find yourself back at the same point again. You've done this. Before. I, I'm sure most of you have done this. I've done this hundreds of times. Yeah, I'm going to say, no, not hundreds of times. Um, I have done this 42 times, in case you're wondering what the ultimate question is. OK, so you repeat this process over and over and over again. It just keeps going. And next week, you'll start another project again. And then at some point in time down the road, even if it's just yourself, even if you spent weeks designing exactly how the architecture is going to work and solve all your problems. Um, now, I also will say this. This is not a solve all your problems thing. This is more like a uh, let's figure out how to think through these problems in a better way. And I'll also present some specific code uh, samples along the way. OK, so insanity. 
doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's what we're doing. The point is, is that the hammer that we're, hit, that we're hitting the nails with, it's broken. And yet we keep doing this. We keep thinking, OK, I'm just going to repair the same lines of code that, or types of uh, pro problems and patterns that I had last time and invent a new solution to these problems. OK, so this leads us to where some of the problems <coughs> I can't turn this. <laughs> it still thinks it's presenting. OK, let's stop the slide. Stop, stop, stop. Disconnect. Yay. <laughs> OK. I have no idea what's happening to the recording right now, because it's technically recording that screen. And it's from this laptop that it's recording it. OK, connect. You know what? That was supposed to be the optional item. I have a second solution, and I'm just going to go through it right now. There's my bag. Display adapters. And I am now hardwired. That one works for this. That. One end goes in here. The other end will pull the projector off at some point. Yes. It's, so I'm addressing this directed at programmers, but. That's good to know. Um, actually, okay. So first off, programs. Okay. okay. Now let's see who does not program, or who is very very beginner and just barely touching. Okay, so that's actually a decent number. Um, maybe about 50-50 or 60-40, something around there. Okay, so that is actually very good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I will try to keep things a little bit more uh, global in scope. Like but, I know us in Alaska, in Alaska, most of us are, you know, got a little bit of tech art, but we're mostly from the art side of the community. Okay. So putting an asset and something things together that maybe somebody else has coded, but I have no idea what's going on under the hood. Or, you know, so like let me... Let me ask you a question then. Um, the part that I said already about you start a project and then at some point in time you just want to throw the whole thing away and start over again. Oh, Do you? For sure. Yeah. Okay. Especially with like how we organize our assets and naming conventions or where stuff is saved on reports or how reports interface with the community. Um, yeah, that's something that I think we're going to have to look at and think about how we can make that work better. Okay. How we keep documentation on how to do all the things for the art asset. Yay. That is definitely fair. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I'm definitely going to get into some spots that will help you. There will be some spots that will maybe put the artist to sleep. And my apologies on that part. Um, but there w should be some good takeaway that you get from this as well. Okay. So the first part is programming the ultimate game. Except. This is not about programming video games. You could technically be doing anything. And there's a mistake here. Let's go to this. Programming, comma, the ultimate game. What I'm, in, what I'm going to show you is a psychological reason why you should look at programming itself or any other trade skill as the ultimate video game. And it works really well for programming because you're actually in front of a video screen. Um, but programming is one of the when you're doing your trade you're end up you end up finding yourself facing the exact same things that excite or bore or uh, frustrate you from actual video gameplay 
And I'm going to show a few of those comparisons right away. There's a couple that are really obvious. And I've done a huge study on this for years, taking a look at it, and I found like 20 some odd comparisons and actually designed ahead of time. I ended up designing how I run projects based on this. OK, so the first thing, um, who here has played a video game and after a few minutes, you are just incredibly bored with this game and you don't want to play it again? All right, cool. Um, code is the exact same way. Thank you. Response. So programming is the, exa is the exact same way. Who here, particularly programmers, um, but artists can respond in similar, um, has faced an issue where you end up having to do a repetitive task over and over and over again. And it's one of those things, like, as a programmer, we're often given the, that opportunity that if, if, let me step back a little bit, if we're in a video game, we are limited by the video game scope of what we can do. So if it's a boring game, we're stuck there. Uh, or we just throw the whole thing away and give up on that game. Um, otherwise, we have the ability as programmers to start expanding, coming up with new ways. Um, for artists, it might be that you start like, looking at processes that can automate steps for you um, or tools that would assist. But um, for programmers, we can start adding complexity. We start designing our own complexity into it to keep our brains interested because we get bored quickly. All right, but then we also face the mirror of this, frustration. Who here has played a game where something in it you just could not solve? It was just annoying and it was just frustrating. You eventually maybe gave up the game, threw it away, maybe threw it at a wall, I don't know. But this often is you leading to this as another thing to consider. You're, a lot of the projects that you might have faced this exact issue on is code you've written and then eventually find yourself in that exact same point of frustration. Why did I do this? So, <laughs> mine as well. So the thing is, is that at least for coding on this sense, um, there's all sorts of problems that we end up engineering into our code. And a lot of it is just because we don't even necessarily know how to think through this type of problem. The fact that our code keeps getting more and more frustrating over time. It feels like one of those things that just has to happen everywhere. And in a lot of cases, there might not be a particularly great solution out of it, but there are some really good tools and utilities along the way. So you'll notice this section is called weakness, but then it's two people playing chess. People playing chess, you don't usually associate like this is a weak develop, uh, design, but this leads back to that same point. We want to challenge ourselves. We want to challenge ourselves. And there, there's a slide that I want to take us back to. Usually this works so much better. Touch, oh, pen, good. <laughs> yeah, that one. Okay, so we end up in these complex scenarios and we end up des designing a single pathway to get through it. We figure out, okay, we need to do these things, but then there's all these other little parts. I mean, anyone who's designed a project or designed a path that you're going to start developing something, um, you have the core parts that you start to figure out but then once you actually go, it's, you don't know everything going in. There's going to be like a hundred other things that you have to add that were never on your lists to begin with. You usually think of them as these small parts. But every one of those small parts has this chance to become something completely different that goes against the grain of your entire program. And you might end up with a hundred or a thousand different types of architecture inside of your own program. Even though you, you may even have a document that says these are the primary architectures we're using for how things communicate, how they talk. All right. Do that. There. Okay. So every new turn is a new opportunity. Every new little class that we create, every new little part of the program or part of a picture that we're starting to create is a new opportunity to do something in a different way. And that's part of what keeps our interest up. We're developers, we're designers, we're whatever trade you're doing. You want to create new things. You want to experience and learn new things. There's nothing wrong with that. 
There's nothing wrong with that until it actually gets to the fact that you have to create a project that is going to be large scale and last a while and then someone else is going to walk in and you want them to go, wow, this is actually really nice code, but that almost never happens. Okay, so let's get into a specific code option. And I'll address a little bit about this to begin with, uh, the structure of the presentation. So to begin with, I walked through a little bit of the psychology that leads to this. Um, and now I'm going to go uh, very much into like a specific item of the code and how we deal with this. Um, and then I'm going to split this out to another architecture that I actually, I'm going to show you one of the architectures that I have on a project that I work on on the side um, uh, to give some examples and then get this open to discussion on this stuff in questions and start addressing everything that we can. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a pattern. Is anyone familiar with the observable pattern? Okay, a couple of people have their hands up. This is good. So let's see, show the real slide. Oh, good, I have that. So one thing I want to point out, observable, this is, I'm, I'm going to get back into this slide later on, but you'll notice this is, uh, this is PowerPoint. This is PowerPoint. Um, and I'm still running PowerPoint at this time. You're actually seeing a, f a snapshot of my, one of my design documents, an architectural document I use on a project called Virtual Theater. Uh, here's one of the things that stands out. When you create an architecture, who's, re who's read documentation on a program or a product and there are 20 pages of stuff to go through to start figuring out like what do you even need to get started with? And then that document is expected to be a standard that everyone has to apply and understand. But it's 20 pages. You don't even understand the project yet. You just came on board. This, this is going to be almost a nightmare to start figuring out. So eventually, you just kind of get the gist of the ideas you need, and you, move, you start doing your work, but you're editing stuff without having an actual architectural plan in mind. Only a few people have it in mind, and then you've got all these weeds of code that start spreading out in whatever direction they want to. All right, so um, in observables, let's see. So the challenge is classes need to tell each other to do things, and they need to share information about events and state. Um, now, this ends up causing, in a lot of cases, uh, us to write code that has one class has to know about another class. So one piece of code has to know about another piece of code. And that starts making this spaghetti code where we have all these lines between things where this class knows what this class is doing and this class knows what this class is doing and sometimes we even create back and forth communications to make that work. Um, so the solution is the events and states will be passed into a central manager and no other classes will know about each other. No classes will have reference to another class. In very, a, there's a few points where that steps aside, but for the most part, everything that needs to talk to each other will have a centralized way of doing it that does not directly connect them. Um, when you have, the, this is the weeds that we're talking about. You have all these different points in code, and they all have to come up with ways to talk to each other. If you can come up with one standardized solution to allow things to communicate, it makes things run better. So going to this documenting, this format of how I document things, oh, I can draw. Um, so first part was the challenge. I write down exactly what the key problem is. I write a title for it. In this case, observables, it's a known common pattern that people know of uh, or that you can look up online. And then I write down how we're solving it. And then on top of that, I add another section. And, oh, I didn't get the updated picture, which suddenly worries me, but whatever. Um, I write down some key points that you can identify in the actual code of the project to say, hey, here's where you go look to see an example of it, or here's how you use it. So in one slide, something you can sit down in a presentation, in a room, in a meeting, and just run through like a presentation, and you say, here's the problem, here's the solution, and then here's the challenges. And what you can't see in here is that when you have details like why you designed it this way, why you built it all up, put that in the notes. So, and make it an open challenge. That's one of the big things. Like, always have other people question what you're doing and decide, is this the right thing? Is there, are there problems with it? And then they can also take a look through the notes and say, if they want to challenge something, like, hey, I know a better way to do this. And it's like, that's almost all of us come into a project thinking, hey, I know a better way to do that part. That part looks annoying. But you don't necessarily know the reasons why they did it. And a lot of times, they don't know the reasons why they did it. Okay. 
So let's take a look at an example of this. Um, can everyone see this okay? All right. Any, uh, raise your hand if you want the lights turned off. Okay, we got a couple people. Can we get the lights off? <laughs> so I'm going to first give you an example, a bad example. Here is bad code. This code does a bad thing, that code does a bad thing, or did a bad thing. Okay, so it, this is Unity, we're looking at this, um, so this is very code specific, sorry artists, you can put your heads down now if you like. Uh, public class, so we have over here, did a bad thing, where this one class is, oh sorry, I wanted to start with this one. I have a pen, I can write this one. That one, okay. So this code, uh, has a boolean that a thing has been done. We don't know what it is, what the event is. This could be anything that falls into your code. Um, and then we have an update method that if you ever press the space bar while the game is running, um, it will mark that the thing has been done. Now, we have another class that wants to know about what this thing is. Um, and that class is did a bad thing. We want to know did the other thing do the bad thing. So at the beginning, we find out where that other class is. This is our hard reference to the other class. We now have started our spaghetti code. Okay, so from that spaghetti code, we now are checking every single update frame whether or not this variable has switched to true. So now we have two points in our code that are every single frame of the game are checking to see if something has happened. Now that one seems fairly obvious. There's a, a, a lot of actual reasons why you choose observable and not just uh, so you don't have to update stuff. Here's one of the big things. Like, uh, Well, actually, let me get to explaining it. Let's show the differences. Um, so the next one, skip on. Good, I'm at the right spot. That went out of order, did it? Yes. Okay, sorry, these two slides got out of order, so I'll have to go back to that. Okay, so first we have do a bad thing. This is the code that was, it had a Boolean that something else was gonna be paying attention to, and we are checking the input to see if something happens. And I have changed this into an observable pattern. Um, so the observable pattern, we create a class, a class that just says a good thing happened. What I recommend in this for observables is you literally create classes for every type of communication that will happen between different classes. And then you say a good thing happened, and for the exact same code that figures out that something happened, I'm no longer storing a Boolean value on that. I'm no longer storing the fact that that happened inside of the class. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying static, I keep pointing to this, static, a good thing happened, I'm using generics in this case, um, and then trigger change. Trigger change is sending one of these things to the static thing to say anyone that is listening to this particular class, to changes to that class, I will now notify them of this. No reason for them to go back and check. I will, I promise I will tell them about it. Okay, so let's go on to the previous slide, which was supposed to be the future slide. And now we have did a bad thing, which was checking for that change. Um, so there's the original did a bad, here's the original did a bad thing. Um, and it's the exact same code that we saw originally, but then this is the code that it changed to. At the start of the program, we go to the same static function, which we could call observable, we could call static, we could call state, we can call it just about, we could call it a uh, dog if we want to. Uh, the naming doesn't really matter, you just want something that makes sense. Um, okay, and particularly I almost never use the word observable in my actual code just because I find it a pain to type out. Uh, all right, so in this, there's a special item called wire up change. And then I pass in the function that it's gonna call when something changes. So this, this function will get called. And we don't care to actually check. There, there's no longer an update function inside of there. So there's no longer an updates function inside of this. Instead, we've just said, hey, when this happens, let us know. And then this static thing says, hey, if anyone ever sets or triggers a change to this class, we will call every method that has been wired up to this. And it makes it incredibly easy to start notifying things. 
One of the things I realized that there's a, uh, a large scale project I'm working on. I work at Bright Machines. I'm not, I don't work for Keyword Studios. Um, but at Bright Machines, we have this large scale Unity project that I'm working on. And it just occurred to me, like right before I was doing this presentation, that I don't use uh, Unity's update method anywhere in the code. We have a couple points in the code where there is a. Uh, 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 we have a there's a an asset called fingers which controls like touch controls uh, mouse controls and basically just unifies this into one standard set of events so it's technically feeding into the update system but our code never does we use their code we get an update that uh, a touch has happened um, we trigger coroutines or various things to happen but we never actually use the update method ourselves. Um, which for Unity, for Unity developers, that's probably a very strange concept, the idea of not using the update method. This is the basic frame, or the basic point of code where you put almost every bit of logic that your game does. And in this case, I'm saying I'm throwing it away. I did still have one thing that was checking the conditions of the user input. Uh, that first class that was checking to see did the user press space, and if they did, set this Boolean value. Um, in this case, uh, let's see. In this case, we have actually just triggered the, the change from another line of code, and then this one is just listening. It just gets called, and it does whatever it needs to. Okay, so there are a lot of patterns I could get into. Um, there are 24 patterns, I believe, or was it 22 or something like that, from the Gang of Four. Um, and these are two books that are out on the series. These are from like the 90s. Um, so very, very old books, but still very, very common. There's uh, about, like, I think they still have reference to singletons in there, which in general the community has started to move against for good reasons. Um, but this is the original book, and then this is a book that was focused on JavaScript to be able to apply these patterns, and it is much easier to read. So if you want to start looking into this and you're doing Unity, this Java book works really well for it. But it starts talking about patterns. Reservable is one of them. Uh, there's a whole lot of other patterns in there that you start getting into. And it's good to learn those ones. Most every single thing in there has been tried and true over and over and over again. And there's things you learn even about, for me, I, when I read it uh, again a little bit ago, I found out that uh, I had been using uh, factory methods wrong. Who here knows about factory methods? Okay, basic idea of a factory method, you have a method that generates, uh, that you call on that generates an object for you. So it deals with all the things of setting it up, wiring it up, doing whatever it needs to. All right, um, but one of the things that the pattern talks about is uh, a key strength of it is that it's actually passing that, fa the factory passes off the responsibility to the individual classes. It says, I know about these classes that I can create, um, let me go ask which one thinks it's supposed to handle this. That way every time you write a class, it says here are the properties you're being fed, do you think you should be responsible for this? And then that class takes over and the factory gives it back. And it's a kind of a different mentality than I had been using it, where I just have a factory that understands all that logic. But the secondary part of the logic actually allows you to split it out so you can have separate DLLs in your project, so you can't actually, uh, if you have a second DLL or you're inheriting another DLL that has this manufacturing program. Uh, I just forgot the term for it. Uh, the manufa what was the method? Factory, factory method, thank you. Got into manufacturing. All right, so the factory method. Um, your factory method is isolated to the library of code that you're already in. So as soon as you inherit that, as soon as you pull that library into another project, anything that you create that it could have generated, that factory method knows nothing about. That's one of the reasons why the original pattern discusses using, uh, uh, passing that responsibility off to the class to define. And then the class has to notify the factory somehow that it's there. Um, but that kind of changes a lot of the way that I've done factory. I, I'm assuming, does that change a lot of other people's opinions about how factory works? Okay. All right. So that's just me. Whatever. <laughs> and like a, a partial wave. But. All right. So anyway, let's go on. Now we're getting into pattern design. I could have gone on and done like a variety of different patterns and specific ones, but these are all things you can find online. There's tons of documentation, tons of great videos on them. 
Um, what there is not a lot of great documentation and video on is actually designing your own. And if you want to create a set of standards that you use for your project, you really need to start figuring out a good solid way to start engineering them and how to document them. And I showed you one example with the uh, document on this. Um, but yeah, anyway, so you're designing your own patterns now. What could go wrong? Here's one of the immediate problems. Um, this is a problem that I ran into a lot. We have over here, this is actually like a $1,400 pocket knife. It's, I thought it was an edited image. It's actually a real thing. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it, it supposedly works. And anyway, it does all these things. I remember when I started getting into architecture and starting to reinvent the, the same program I was doing over and over again. One of the first ways I started dealing with architecture was jumping in and saying, let's get this architecture to do almost everything for us. Let's start figuring it out. Like, let's dive into all these weeds that I've jumped into and say, hey, I had this problem over here. Well, maybe I could modify this one major part of the program to do all this stuff for us. And that never, that, that ended up just failing. And I'll give you a big reason psychologically why. Um, code, what, what drives us? Remember what drives us? The challenge. We want to face that challenge day in and day out. We want to have our brains working. Not to the frustrated point, not to the point where we go home and question why we're in this industry, but to the point where we're just looking at why, uh, how do we solve this new thing? How do we come up with a new way to do this? And especially like also being able to go to everyone and say, hey, I came up with this new way that solves all this headache because we've all come from backgrounds where we've run into these frustrations. And being able to come up with something that says, hey, here's a, a way to solve this. It's like, oh my god, this is awesome. Everyone listen to this. I want to show you it. Uh, which is why I'm here. Well, sort of. OK, so solving everything often ends up creating a lot of scenarios where you've generated this gigantic architectural framework without actually doing all the little steps along the way. And what happens is you get very, very heavily locked into one specific architectural plan. Like you, everything has to interact with this one code base. It all becomes very frustrating. And as soon as anything finds a difficulty with it, it unravels that entire part of the architecture. It's one of the reasons why a, a very common thing like with sprint design, um, how we do agile, we do sprints, we develop a short amount. We get something completed and get it out there. We just want to have a small amount of stuff going out and make sure it works. Um, don't develop any code for stuff that you're not actually going to use yet. That's a general rule of thumb these days. <clears throat> okay, so having these gigantic monolithic structures in our code that are trying to take responsibility for everything starts taking the idea out that instead of me being able to face a challenge, I now have to figure out how it works inside of there. And now I have, to, I have to figure out what, and just basically learn from this. And often these monolithic structures are very poorly documented. Yes? I have a, uh, you just mentioned Agile Sprints. I yeah. have a really burning question that I'd like to ask. Do Go. people do TDD in game development, or Unity specifically, or is that like, is it just too hard to do? Like, I mean, I've been working with test runner and stuff, but like a lot of what you're talking about, that's the one first thing I would say. I will, I'll, I'll give my feedback and anyone else is welcome to uh, pipe in after that. Yeah. Um, so in my experience, like I have tried TDD. I, I have tried test-driven development. And the idea is that you basically create a series of tests in your code and then you create a couple of classes and methods that are the idea of what your program is supposed to be. And then the example is that when you run your code at the beginning, all the tests will fail. And then you, as you start filling in the code, all the tests should start working. Does that match your perspective? Or? Yeah, sure. I mean, okay. which the, even having to define it is yeah. telling for me, right? You know so, I mean? so that's the general architecture of my understanding of TDD. So one of the big problems that we face is that that also means you have to understand the nature of how every part of that is going to work before you even start it, to actually say, Okay, I know that this is how my code is going to work, that it's going to be structured this way, it's going to have these commands, and sometimes you work that stuff out, but even when you do, you usually find methods and structures that you want to change about it along the way. We're realizing that once you get into the weeds of it, this detail changes how I need to address this. 
Um, in my experience, I think it's good to define test cases to begin with uh, on paper. And then, so you know some of the key problems you are expecting to run into. But then you develop it, and before the sprint is over, one standard that I try to apply is that my work on a task is not done until it's unit tested. Until it's unit tested, and I have done some sort of front end test to actually make sure it works. So for me, that test driven development kind of, I flip it on its head where it's like, my code is not done until this list starts. But the test driven development suggests that you actually don't start your code until the tests are done. Uh, but then that just, you almost always have to change your tests or do stuff. And that's been my experience with it. Uh, anyone else have a different experience they find with this? Yeah? We were exploring it a little bit at Microsoft, but we didn't really implement it much. We were just sort of exploring how to utilize it. And we never really found a good way to use it in terms of uh, a good way to use it within Yeah, you, that's something? Yeah, it does like part of the code that kind of needs unit testing, but there's other parts that don't. So the stuff that should be unit tested, like the algorithm type stuff, you want unit test for that. The cross daily code is just going to be a handful of unit tests. Yeah, I, I've, I've had success. My background is more in Java. That's what it's been about. The right test suites for those. Because the thing that's killing me is I build something and then I just can't test it anymore. Because it's so bad, it's just like you fall apart. And so if I can write a test suite and I have it running, but I can't write it to run the code that's in it, you know, is fun or it looks good, right? Um, yeah. mm. One thing that I'll. Oh. You can do that. And um, I was talking this morning with um, Maxa. I'm more of an artist, but that's part of our sprint development. We do this type of thing. Like Google has a service where you can test look good by sending it out to people. Yeah, they actually have to build an <laughs> automated build that it's sending out to humans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like that. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that exact same setup before as well. Where it just has in the test automation, like this is part of Visual Studio, that you could actually have it hand off requests to go have a manual tester come and interrupt part of the test. Uh, or that it has a bunch of stuff it's doing manually, but then it's just saying, hey, here's a couple parts that I just can't automate. I don't have a good way to do this. And that actually leads to a, a good example, a good place to, that I find to split code um, and split your testing on the code. Um, one thing is that uh, when you're testing, um, oh, and by the way, just to let everyone know, the, uh, I think I said it at the beginning, I'm not sure, but this is intended to start becoming very conversational. So like right now, where all, we had all this conversation, this was not interruption in any way, this is intentional. Like, I, and he wasn't paid to ask the question. <laughs> Um, okay, so testing. Here's a big thing. Um, who here tries to test against uh, code coverage? Like try to get like 80, 90% of your code? Show of hands. Okay. Um, I used to be in that boat. I used to feel like, okay, 100% of my code, that's where I need to be. Get 100% of it tested, but that doesn't, that doesn't really show you a lot. Um, some things are just very difficult to test automatically. Um, basically, every single program, you're still going to have a certain set, a, a certain number of user test cases, like someone just running through and actually using the program and trying it out. Um, basically, here's a rule of thumb to split it. If the test will fail, if the thing that you want to test will be very clear to a user who is using it that that thing has just broken, then great, that, that's the test case. It is very easily exposed to a user who would see it, and they will identify that there is an error here. Otherwise, every other piece of code that is typically not right in front of the user, you want that code to be tested and do an automatic unit test on it. And you should be able to do this without having to create this entire framework of other test services, of other classes that need to be statically available. Um, who here uses singletons in their code? Does it, who here knows what a who here does not know what a singleton is? Okay, a singleton is basically a static class. It means that uh, if I have a class called player manager, 
I could create it statically, and then all the methods are just available at any point in time. I just say player manager dot get list of players, and it returns a list of players. And I don't have to get connected to that. Nothing has to tell me where it is. It's just statically available. It's always available in code. Um, so that, pat that, that general pattern of singletons, it's very, very enticing to game developers. Um, almost every single Unity project I've ever worked on uses a lot of static code where you have these common places that you go to and ask for various things. But when you're writing a test case, and all of a sudden you say, I need to test this particular thing. I needed to test what happens when the player takes damage. Um, does it actually reduce their hit points? But that player class is already talking to this static implementation of uh, uh, shields or some other t part of the code just to define things. And if I'm actually going to run a test case, I need to do something to fake that part out. But that's also talking to this other class. And so I've got this thing that starts to disappear into the weeds again uh, about all these, uh, just all these complicated little areas that I have to manage just to make one tiny test case work. And that is an idea of code that is not, uh, that's not good at architecture. Yes? Yeah, I think that's part of the forcing function is design, right? If I have to write spaghetti text, Yes. It's a, yeah, and what he just said was, just reiterating it, was that uh, this is one of the big reasons for test-driven design, that when you actually start uh, designing your test cases first, then you've guaranteed that your code is not super dependent on all these other things, and it's easy to test, because you've done that from the beginning. But that's one of the reasons why I say that uh, you should still, I, I don't adhere to test-driven development specifically, but I make sure that before the end of the sprint, before I qualify a task is done, it is tested anyway. Because I'll go through that same thing and most of the time or most of the time I get through it and I'm like, yay, my code worked. Sometimes I realize, oh wow, I have this dependency and this is making it very difficult to test. Um, and that tells me I'd had a problem with my code. Go fix it now. Okay. So Unit test your existing code as much as you can, the things that you have direct control over that are easy to test, and anything that isn't, um, it should either be because it is a remote requirement, like a server that you're talking to or a service, and if you can, create a test system for that. Um, I'll give you an example of a test system I generated recently. Um, there was a point where my code, it was WebGL, had to talk to JavaScript on the page. But when I'm running it inside of Unity, I can't have that page running at the same time. And otherwise, I have to spend the time to let the entire WebGL build go out to the page, run the test then, which that could take 10 minutes, depending on what's going on. So uh, let's see. Lost track of where I was. <laughs> you build your own tests. Yes, yes. So I built a script. Who here knows about scriptable objects in Unity? OK. If you haven't used them before, go look it up. It's awesome. There's some great tutorial intros on uh, Unite conferences. Um, but basically the idea is you, I just create a little tiny asset that sits in my project and I can just, I, I put in a little message, a like little JSON message inside of it and then it ha I put a button on it so whenever I click it inside of my Unity IDE, it automatically sends a message that would basically duplicate the exact structure of a message coming in from JavaScript. Um, so I created it so my services could be duplicated. My dependencies outside of my environment could be duplicated. And then I can still run my tests instantly. Then the only problem makes, is to make sure that that actually is doing the right thing. And there's not a problem with my little test script. But that's a point where you actually run the program. If it doesn't work, oh, there's a red flag that your test script might not be right. OK, so let's see. This is the last page of this. And there's a. Sort of. This is the last page of this one. Um, make code stronger. This is biggest rule of thumb that I will apply to designing architectures is take the processes that uh, when you're designing an architecture, design it so that when you are dealing with the problems, you have a chance to really think through it yourself. Don't take away the challenge from these little from these little pieces. You should be creating small things. You should be creating these little tools and still be able to address these challenges that interest you. Think about what interests you about what you're doing. And then think about your architecture. If you're planning on implementing something, how is that going to affect what I actually like doing? Am I getting rid of some of the steps that I enjoy doing day to day? 
And that's a big thing to always consider. Because if you're getting rid of that for yourself, challenge, chances are you're getting rid of it for the rest of the people on your team who might like the exact same challenge, and then the code becomes boring. And that's where you start jumping out, creating your own new architectures in the weeds, and things start changing. And you change the form of the program until nobody ends up liking it anymore. OK, so I do want to lead over to another slideshow. Yeah, uh, discard. What was the question? Uh, what was the name of the tool that does the automated Git Oh, okay. All right, so I want to go back to something that's not showing up. Oh, now I need to duplicate. <laughs> and it's still recording. That's good. But OK, this will be fine. Let's put the keyboard and mouse back on. OK, and then take this window, drag it over here. OK, so this is an actual architectural design document that I use on one of my projects. It's very, very lightweight. Um, one of, it's for virtual theater, and it's for the second, second uh, wave of the program. We did the first one, which took a lot of shortcuts on purpose to get something out the door, and then the second one, which is supposed to learn from the stuff and make a better product. Uh, OK, where is there? So I showed you this one already, observables, where we had one challenge. We found one of the challenges that we were commonly facing in the code, and we created a way to deal with it. And I had mentioned briefly that this, the picture that I had on the slideshow was actually uh, an outdated one. And that was just because I was missing one of these methods down here that you could call set, and it will set a value. So observable is a fairly common one. There's a few other ones that are in here that are also fairly common. Um, this one is not. This is one of my own. So in this case, we were actually using static a little bit more than I like at this particular moment in time. So this is not necessarily a solution I'm proud of. But the code works, the architecture works, and the ways that I solve the problems are documented. So in this case, I had multiple singletons. I had multiple static classes in my code that created all these points of references for potential spaghetti. Uh, but one of the big problems with that was testing. How do we actually test these things? And part of the reasons for this, just to let you know, was we had dependencies on other things that we didn't control, or it would have been a pain in the butt to just go out and fix everything. Uh, so what we actually, let's take a look at the challenge. Static data and methods are commonly employed because of the sheer ease in managing data and actions across classes. So all these classes can just interact to find out what's the player's score, what is the current player, um, where is the player located, um, where are the save files, let's save, a, let's save this right now. Um, all the different items, we just have easy access to it, it's very enticing. Okay, uh, they can make testing very difficult, as we brought up earlier, since the static state has no built-in way to reset itself. So what I actually did was create a system to allow any static point in our program to reset itself. So my test cases can change how the static structure works to work for a test case and then reset everything right back to the beginning um, for all the rest of the test cases. So the solution, no class should have static members unless it also carries a static reset function. Uh, this should only be used for architectural management and not the direct operation of code. So if it's another thing that helps on an, uh, an architectural level and not like this class just wants to know about the player. Knowing about the player is not architecture. Knowing how to talk to the player is. So this project specific examples, reset.invoke, resets the entire application for testing only. That's was really the only purpose for it. Um, this has a couple of things that a lot of people would consider violations of like good uh, code standards. Um, particularly the uh, uh, reset invoke, we actually have code inside of our classes that's in the production code specifically for the purpose of testing, to restore something to a testable state. Uh, that's something that when you're talking about test, good test practices and development that most people just don't like. And I agree with that. Uh, again, it was shortcuts and solutions to the shortcuts. But 
that is okay. Almost every single point in time, or uh, almost every project you work with, you're probably going to have to face at some point legacy code. You're importing an asset from Unity that you're using someone else's code. You don't want to rewrite all their code. You wanted to bring it in to use it. Or you are depending on a library or service that has their own way of doing things. Well, if it's different, if there's a part of your project that is different and it's just easier to maintain, to keep that difference up than what you consider a strong standard, keep it documented. Keep your solutions of how to work with it documented and don't let every single developer who comes in invent their own way. And when people first come onto this project, if anyone joins this project, I can show them this document and there is your developer startup day. Here's how everything works in our program. You get to look through it and see, this is, here's the problems, here's how we solved it, very quick solutions. And if you forget one, it's a slide. You just go right back through it and if it, there's some things that are pretty easy to identify. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. Uh, state events. Um, state machines. I've always found state machines to be a little bit weird and confusing because it's actually a very, my understanding is a very simple thing, but the writing around almost every use of it is very, very complicated and confusing to follow. Does anyone else, have, who here knows about state machines? Who here finds typical documentation on trying to understand it confusing to follow? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, one of the things, like, this is still following pretty similar to state machines, um, where I want to know the state of the program. I want to be, I'm also tying it in with observable as well, where I want to know when things change. Um, so instead of uh, typically your state machine kind of triggers these things to happen, these changes to happen in your program that tells it all to go do whatever it's supposed to. Be. Um, but in this case, I'm using something where other things can pay attention and listen to these state changes, and they get events notified of them. I don't think the default state machine actually includes an event system. It's there to like trigger other things and know about what those are. And I never really liked that approach. But that's one of the arguments. Anytime that I have a new developer come on, we can actually talk through each of these. Now this one I didn't have any additional notes on. Um, a lot of these ones I don't. Some of them I do. Uh, I'm gonna bring up a very specific problem I ran into recently with Unity that uh, some of you may find kind of interesting. Um, who here knows about the runtime initialization methods? Okay, I got a hand up in the back. I will tell you what this is. Unity um, has a way that it will trigger a static method in your code uh, without having any mono behavior be the responsibility or the, be the, the cause of it. Um, it's a way to trigger initialization in your code that you have nothing, like you could start with a completely blank scene with absolutely no game objects in it and you could still use one of these methods to start loading everything in and design the entire thing. I typically recommend that and let, recommend against that unless you have a very strong reason to do something like that. And there are a few places that have very valid reasons. Um, okay, so here was one of the challenges. And this is part of designing your own architectures, designing your solutions. Um, I did not take face value at things. Uh, the test event has, actually, you know, I can probably just bring up a code example. Bring this over here. That is virtual theater. I'm working. Oh my god, that is so weird. <laughs> okay, and let's reset. So yes, control shift F. Oh, I have to look at that one. Validate. Uh, what do we want? I just forgot the name of the method. Initialize. Entire solution. There. And I got the name a little bit wrong. Runtime initialize on load method. Let me get rid of some other stuff so that we can actually see this. Uh, let's hide, hide. And so this is code that's going to run. It's, go, it's guaranteed to run. Unity will find any static method that private or public, that has this on top of it and will execute it. And there are four points in time in which it will execute. One of them is before the scene loads. 
uh, key things to note, that's before any scene loads. So if you have something where you're loading multiple scenes, which you can have multiple scenes load together as one, um, and a lot, of program, a lot of projects take advantage of that, it will execute every time. Now, this was something important to test because there's things in here, um, let's see, there's before scene load, there is uh, before, you know what, I've got it right here. I don't have to remember them all. There's before scene load, after scene load, um, after assemblies loaded, and after, uh, before the splash screen. So these are the four events that you can trigger, which I believe the before splash screen was the default that you don't include anything. I don't remember that off the top of my head though. Um, anyway, here was an interesting thing to, so, okay, so here's the key thing. If you have initialization code you want your program to do, this is a great way to do it. And I started to depend on it until I ran into some problems. And this is one of the points where the testing will help you recognize things, but in some cases it doesn't. Um, when I'm running in the IDE, after assembly is loaded and before splash screen never executes from the IDE. So if you're depending on something to go off at that point in time, in the IDE, when you're running your code in the inspector, that will not happen then. It will not happen. And here's one of the big reasons that I was facing this. Um, anyone who's developed in Unity somewhat regularly, you might have found an issue where you're trying to depend on another game object that should exist, but it hasn't been created yet. It doesn't exist. You're trying to reference it. So you keep getting all these null references all over the place. Um, so I was designing a system to guarantee that any of these mono behaviors that need to be available are. Okay, so I wrote a small class um, that I actually have posted out online somewhere. It's I think it's on Core or something, or Unity Answers, uh, that talks through exactly what the problems were, shows the code, and what the solutions were. Um, before scene load seemed to have been working every time. I actually found a case where it seemed to stop working in my code now, and I don't know why yet, so I have to revisit this. But, what, or, sorry, going off track here. Um, Effectively, you want to start looking at how everything is going to be solved in here, how these things are going to work. And let's see if I actually have that solution. On no, I don't have that solution on this laptop. Uh, but the idea is that uh, here was the effective way that it had to start. Um, during the constructor classes on your mono behaviors, constructors get fired right away, and it doesn't matter whether the game object is enabled or not. The constructors will fire. Awake and start will not fire on the, in those cases, um, which makes it a little bit annoying. Now, when in Unity, when you actually have a constructor, the constructor gets fired, nothing has been deserialized yet. So this means that none of your settings, none of the references that you set up in Unity are set up. None of the values of how much time something has to process or where the file save location is, if you have that set as a string in your inspector. None of those things are actually set up. Um, so, but at the same time, not all methods are guaranteed to fire and to let them know. Like if the game object is disabled for some reason, how are we supposed to know? So we have to use the awake or start functions. So I actually created a separate class called mono init, where basically every class, every mono behavior's constructor notifies this one that, hey, here I am. Once the program actually starts, notify me to start initializing and uh, at a safe point that I have all my serialized values at that point. Um, and then what that does is that one makes sure that it's awake. There's kind of an interesting trick to do this. Uh, but it, once it's awake, or once it starts, it sends out a, met, uh, a call back to each one of those classes that identify themselves and says, hey, run your initialization now. Everything's been deserialized, you're good to go. Uh, uh, an interesting challenge though, what if a designer comes in, starts messing with Unity, and they didn't have that class on there, that mono init class that actually tells it, oh hey, it's awake now, or it's started. Um, our code would just not do anything, and we would have hundreds of errors everywhere but mono init. So then what, what goes on here? It's, it's all really confusing. So here was an interesting solution for that. Um, Using this exact same thing, runtime initialize and load, uh, 
after scene loads, so once your scene is fully loaded, everything's supposed to be initialized, all the start methods have been called, uh, but I don't, I think it's before, or right after all the start methods and before the update calls. Don't pay attention to that, you said scene loading is always first, it's time. Yeah. So how do you know what to do? How do, oh, to trigger this? Oh. Yeah. What my code does a separate thing where I put a Boolean value at the top of it when it's important that it should not reset again or initialize again. I put a, uh, a Boolean value right at the top of this that will say um, if already set or whatever I have it set to, um, then return and it just exit out of it. The first thing I do in the actual code once it gets past it is set that value to true. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it does. <clears throat> okay, so one of the things I do is after scene load, you put a static method on that in your class, and you have just you can put a validator on that that says game object dot find object with this type. Your scene has loaded. You've designed this class that it should be there when the scene starts. So if the scene has finished loading and this this code starts running and the game object dot find does not find it in there you know that the designer didn't set it up. The designer doesn't know, but you're gonna throw a log error message. You log an error to the debugger, and now the designer sees it in the list uh, of the things that are messing up. They see that this is not in there, and it's saying, here's one of the other things that I specifically don't, I don't have this in this code example, but on that validation method, I specifically say, uh, we could not find this class inside of here, this mono behavior, attached to any game object. Um, please make sure that it is in the game, it is required. Uh, you should add it to, the, to a root game object called game manager. So I'm actually spelling out the steps to repair the problem that happened, because Unity doesn't really expose that very clearly. If someone wrote code that they wanted to make sure was required in there, how's a designer supposed to know that? There's not exactly any good structure designed in there except for other errors starting to crop up that this is something isn't available at a certain time. Let's see. Oh, I guess I can show a, one small example here of the actual code. And you know what? I want to stop for a second and just kind of ask a question, to, particularly to the artists in here. Um, how has the has this felt like too boring, like not enough use for for you, or or well, I, I some stuff? I find myself thinking about it as it relates more to how I can structure best practices for things that aren't code in Unity. Um, okay. It is kind of interesting to know, just in terms of you know, sometimes I get we get sent small chunks of code bases sometimes, like we don't get the entire thing. And Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the time I try and kind of debug it myself and at least so that I can kind of see if there's something obvious. So it's interesting to know from that perspective. Okay. Uh, I don't I, I don't know that I know enough about coding that if I seen what you said that you told the designer to do that I would be able to like do that. But at least like I at least appreciate that you're telling <laughs> what went wrong and how to fix it so that I can easily send that message Okay, that's good to know. And I, I so I have a, a specific artifact that I think deals better with uh, artists and animators, but still useful for Unity overall. Um, there, one of the things that I personally have found challenging, and I'm posing this as both here's the architecture I have designed for it, and then here, if you guys have suggestions to change it, I am all ears. And are we? Oh, 
I keywords is probably getting antsy because I told them for thirty. But <laughs> oh, what time? Oh my goodness! It's <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'll just go over this one thing really quick. Um, but uh, I posted this out to Quora saying, hey, when I'm taking on an existing project, oh. when I'm taking on an existing project that's already there and there's all these animations called out all over the place, it is a very, it's a big pain to go through and try to figure out what all these animations do if they're not incredibly well named. And try to say, well, this can apply to this object, it does this, it has these potential events, this is what triggers it. Um, getting all those things mapped out and connected, I found to be a pain. Um, anyone here work on animations in Unity? Uh, anyone found that to be an issue? Mostly, well, I mean, a lot of projects I use that I use the, uh, uh, what was it? The timeline graph. And anytime. Okay. I can't solve the perforce issue, yeah. but here was the, so what I ended up running into was trying to take an existing menu that was very, very well done and get it to work inside of my system when there were all these animations called out and they had their own naming structure, but it didn't necessarily make sense to someone who didn't, wasn't part of the design. Um, what I ended up doing to make the animations make more sense um, was effectively any object that had animations it was going to trigger I took the, I, I kept the animation class where it was, and then created a sub object underneath it, a child object, and just called it events. And it had nothing on it except for a transform. It was just an empty object. And underneath that, I put other objects, and those were called uh, task events or something. Uh, and I think animation events, I forget what I named it. I had, if the link was working, I would all work on it, would be able to show it. But um, I create these, uh, Basically, these events. So here's an event that says the character, the the menu will appear. Here's one that says the menu will hide, and it triggers the animation. Now the animations were called like A one B move, A one B trigger, and it's like wait, I I don't know what those mean. And then I have to trigger it and actually get it executed, linked up to the correct object, and get all those things working with pin. So instead, that class would have or that uh, uh, game object would then have another trigger, a simple trigger underneath it that says, here's the name of the animation, here's a reference to the animator that I'm gonna call that on, um, and then this is triggerable as a Unity event. So anytime I want that animation to fire, instead of calling the animation directly and saying, hey, here's the, ref here's the name by string, I put in a reference to that game object that says, hey, here's this game object that says, start the menu. And my code will say, okay, here, there's that one, start, the, it just triggers the event, makes it happen. Um, I don't care what the animation name is called. Uh, and, it just, and then when I'm looking inside of the inspector, I can just expand out that list of events, of animation events that are associated with this. And I get to see, oh, this has a hide, this has a show. Oh, this has a wave, some, or it's something to signify like, hey, look at me, there's a tension, toast, or whatever. Um, and it created a way to organize that. Now that was my solution to that problem, which since I can't display it, maybe I haven't project, or presented it as well, but um, it was one of the things where I faced this problem and I came up with a solution for it. Uh, I did try to bring in other people, but I'm always looking for better ways to do it. And the, any, anim, any, uh, any design I put into this document is always up for challenges. So my apologies on going so long, but yeah, just questions and answers at this point. One thing that's really good is uh, this is a great place for code reviews. Um, so one thing you should always be doing during a code review practice is take a look is did this create some new level of architecture? Some new way that things have to communicate back and forth? Um, and did we already have a way to solve it? If we created something new, Let's put it in the document. If it really needs to be there, let's put it in that document so other people will know this is another type of architecture we're using to deal with this particular situation. Um, but otherwise, uh, I try taking a look at it and say, okay, can I use any of my existing architectures to solve this problem? Can I use an observable to make the communication work here? In some cases, that doesn't work well, even though you have the class-to-class -class communication. Like, I need to tell the enemy that this happened, but I only need one index of the enemy. 
and I don't want to send a message out to every single enemy that then does an if check inside of it. So I might add another layer of architecture on top of that to say, okay, here are the class types that I'm looking for and an ID for a specific instance of it. Uh, so uh, there would be reasons I add new architectures, but that's what I have to call out. If something is isolated and it only sticks to its own class and that's it, great. I don't have to put that in my architectural document. As soon as things start talking between each other, that needs to be part of the architecture. All right, any other questions? You can ask after or whatever. Yeah. Um, I was debating on that. The virtual theater one, uh, uh, the slides that I've shown, uh, I'll probably, yeah, I think that'd be reasonable to show. I'm not gonna pass out the code with it, of course, but uh, <laughs> the slide deck, I mean, you saw the slide deck, it was mostly images, um, but at least this, the one that was up there. Oh yeah, I've got a video. I'll be able to pass it out. I'll do it through the Meetup uh, site and I'll post it in other things. Um, I will say this, if you want early access to it, please contact me on it. I'm not planning on releasing a video for about a month. Uh, the basic thing is like, why show up to events if you can just get the video right after, if you're gonna get the video 10 minutes later. And I like getting people to events, it's more fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it with them. <laughs>